uh, it's, they just think there's another 130 some tribes that are out there they just don't know about and that's the government that doesn't even know about their own people and uh, anyhow uh, you, you say 862 languages surely you're exaggerating um, no I'm not talking about dialects as in the north and the south y'all I'm just talking 862 distinct languages and uh, one of the things uh, we have a lot of people ask us about that how are you going to speak to the people? And uh, simply put, the, there's three trade languages in the country. Anybody that go, comes from one of the tribes that wants to go to town, wants to buy, sell, do any kind of trade in town, is going to have to learn one of the three trade languages. And uh, the first one is called Police Motu. It's a tonal language. It's kind of like Vietnamese. It's kind of an oriental language. The second one's called Pidgin English. It's very close to English. It's an English derivative. It uh, has 2,500 base words. And uh, it's an American heard two people speaking in pidgin, you'd understand about 25% of what was going on. I'm trying to read it, it's a whole other story, but just listening to people speaking in pidgin, you'd know the gist of the conversation. Um, then the third language, uh, we've, we uh, just recently have finished language school for it, it's called English. Uh, we kind of struggled through the language school, but we, we got it done. Uh, but anyhow, um, and the government has now made it law in the country that any schooling that's done in the country has to be done in English. And so over the next 25 years or so, we see a lot of those 800 languages starting to dwindle out as the kids are coming up, uh, going to school, just learning English. And then, you know, in the future, English can become a prominent language in the country. Um, we got to go and spend uh, six weeks in the country about a year and a half ago. I uh, spent four weeks up in the mountains in a town called Garoka. And then uh, we spent the last two weeks that we were there with Brother John Gray down in the swamps in Karama. And uh, while we were there, I asked Brother John if he would... Uh, I told him, you know, our heart's desire to go to Papua New Guinea, and I just, I told him, you know, I asked him if there was some place that he knew of specifically that uh, he, he would send a missionary to. And he began to tell me about these people up in the mountains just to the north of them. And uh, these people up in the mountains, uh, there's five villages up there. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes to fly from where he's at up to these mountain villages, but it takes about three days to walk up to the villages. The 20-minute flight costs us about $25 to get that 20-minute flight up there. Problem is, there, the flight is scheduled twice a week, but in the two weeks we were there, the flight never came. Uh, the, their scheduling sort of thing is just a whole different idea. But anyhow, he began to tell me about these people up in the mountain villages, and God really began to burden my heart for those people. There's a group of about 50 people up in those villages that have pulled out of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church came in the 1950s, and they began to uh, evangelize the entire country. And when they came in the 1950s, they brought a lot of good things with them. Now, their Catholicism wasn't a good thing, but what they did bring was they brought medicine, they brought schooling, they brought food, and uh, they brought things, uh, just your normal aids sort of things. And when they came to the country, they brought these good things with them. And uh, about three years ago, there's a group of about 50 people that pulled out of the Catholic Church. When they pulled out of the Catholic Church, they didn't pull out because doctrinally there was something wrong. They pulled out because they knew that what the Catholic Church was preaching wasn't right. And these people that... As far as we can tell, maybe five to eight of them are saved. The majority of those people aren't saved. But when they pulled out of the Catholic Church, they, they told the priest, they said, there's something wrong there, and we know that there's something wrong. And when they pulled out, the priest told them, he said, said listen, you people don't come to my church, it's going to cost you. He said, you're not going to have my medicine, you're not going to get my schooling. For the last three years, these people live in the bush, they live in the jungles. And what little medicine they did have, for the last three years, they've gone without. They've gone without the schooling for their kids. And it's cost them something. And for the last three years, they've been asking Brother John, please, somebody bring us a missionary. Brother John's tied up where he's at. He's got a, he's got a Christian school there. He's really busy where he's at. There's no way that he can just up and go up in the mountains and work with those people in the mountains. The work that he's got is, is almost too much for him. And so Brother John began to tell me about these people up in the mountains, and God started to burn my heart for them. I, I told you that those, that flight goes twice a week, and I, I tried. kept trying to get up there on a flight, and the Lord just kept closing the door. I'd go down and I'd buy the ticket and I'd put my luggage, check my luggage in so that I could take the flight up there and then the flight would never show up. I mean, we, it, we did this for a week. And uh, we were supposed to leave on a Tuesday morning. And Thursday night before we left, uh, I had been outside work, working with a fellow named Jerry. He's a national guy. Jerry and I had been out there washing the walls for Brother John. He, the mildew grows in a hot humidity area. We'd been out there washing mildew off the walls. And uh, while we were out there, we'd been working all day long. It got about 6 o'clock in the evening and the sun began to set. And we were going to go inside, wash up, eat dinner, and go, go to bed, you know. And uh, we're headed in the house. And as we're headed in the house, these two boys came walking down the road. These two boys, their clothes were nasty. They were, they were torn. They had holes in them. 
they, they had, each of them had a pair of jeans, but they only came down to their knees, and it wasn't because they had cut them off for shorts. It was because they would worn them so long that the legs had just worn off them. They had holes in their clothes. They, they stunk. They were nasty. And they, they, they looked like they'd been out in the jungle for days. And come to find out, these two boys had been walking for three days to come out of those mountain villages to come down and ask Brother John one question. They got there Thursday evening as the sun was setting. Friday morning, they got back up and walked three days back into their village. That one question that they wanted to ask was when can we have another church service? They got there. Brother John had been up there to preach to them twice, and they, they were coming to find out, when can you come and tell us more about God? When can you tell us more about Jesus? These boys spent a week out of their whole life just to find out, when can we just have church? Please, can we just have another service? It's sad because here in the United States, we've got churches all over the places, and people that live right across the street, right down the street from the church, don't darken the doors, not even for a wedding or a funeral. They've been asking for now for three years, somebody please come and tell us about the gospel. In 1985, the Basodio people, a lot of the, there's a, for me to say, uh, real quickly, I'll give you a background, a little bit more about the country. For me to say the average Papua New Guinean is just kind of, uh, it doesn't happen. There's no such thing as the average Papua New Guinean. As you can tell, 862 languages, it, they have different languages. They're going to obviously have different cultures. And I'll tell you more about the different people groups in the, in the slides, but there's one particular one, the Basodio people. One thing that set them apart from a lot of the other areas was that they all spoke the same language. There's several thousand of the Basodio. And in the Basodio, there's several different tribes. And one of the tribes, a missionary, had gone to them and they presented the gospel. And uh, a lot of people in that tribe had gotten saved. Now, if I can't just walk into a tribe and just, tell, and just walk in for the first time and say, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior for your sins. He died on the cross for your sins, and you need to accept him, and you'll escape hell. Because first thing, me being white, me being, it just shows wealth and riches, and they want to do everything they can to please me. And so they'll walk the aisle. I'll have 300 people walk the aisle the first day if I just, okay. just because they want to please me. And they won't know what in the world they're doing. They're coming down, and they're, they'll kneel around an altar, and they got no idea what's going on. So what I, have, what I have to do is I have to come into a tribe, and when I first contact with a tribe, I have to build on a firm foundation and start off, and start off with Genesis. And the way you do it is you start off with a map and you, and you say, here's a, a map of Papua New Guinea and here's your tribe in New Guinea. Some, sometimes the people don't even have an idea that they're part of a country. And you show them here and on the country is where you guys are. And then I take that and I show them a globe and say, here's your country in relation to the world. And their world suddenly becomes humongous. And then I can begin from there and say, God made all this. See, Psalm chapter 19 and verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. See, that national man, when he wakes up in the morning, he steps out on the front porch of his hut, and he looks across the clearing, and he can see the palm tree that's growing on the other side of the clearing. And it's grown, and he knows that that palm tree has grown in his lifetime. And it's nothing that he did, and it's nothing that his spirits did, nothing that the people he's been praying to have done. And the sun comes up in the east, and it sets in the west, and it does it day after day. And it comes up in the east and it sets in the west. And the Bible says in Psalm chapter 19 and verse 3, there's no speech, there's no language, where that voice isn't heard. 862 languages in Papua New Guinea, not a single one misses that fact. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, that they're without excuse. Because there's not even creation itself. Tell you. And so when I come in, I tell them, God made all of this. And then I can build on a firm foundation and tell them about Jesus Christ. And when it comes time to tell them about Christ dying on the cross for their sins, Christ is a hero to them. Amen. And you know, it's sad. Sometimes us as Christians, we grow up in church and we yeah. hear it all our lives and somebody, a preacher can pour his heart out and tell about Christ down on the cross and it just goes in one ear and out the other and we're just thinking about what are we going to eat after church. Yeah. And so the, this missionary had presented to the tribe, he had presented Jesus Christ and a lot of people in the, in the tribe had gotten saved. And they were going to have a, a baptismal service. They went to have this baptismal service, and when they did, they wanted to have a moo-moo, which is dinner on the grounds, or more actually dinner in the ground. And they do is they cut a hole out in the ground, they dig up a hole, and then they'll put hot rocks and banana leaves and then food on it, you know, meat, or uh, you know, they'll put pork in there, and they'll put rat or bat or whatever they can find, or birds, and uh, they'll put uh, vegetables. And uh, they put in this cow-cow, which is like a sweet potato, except they forgot to put the sweet in the potato. And uh, it looks like a sweet potato, but it doesn't have any good taste to it. But anyhow, they, th what's really neat is they'll have cow-cow at the moo-moo, but they don't ha there's no beef, you know. But anyhow, uh, they, they put all this stuff in there, and then they cook it. And then it's supposed to cook it, but it's, 
that never gets cooked. And they pull it out, you know, and it's something to see some mama running around with a chunk of meat in her hand and the blood just running down his pork, you know, and you're thinking, oh, man. Uh, you, you say, how does a missionary handle that? He hopes that he finds the piece that's cooked all the way. Uh, if he doesn't, he hopes nobody's looking while he pitches it. Uh, but anyhow, uh, they had this dinner on the grounds, and after the dinner on the grounds, the people began to go home, and there was one fellow that stuck around. His name was Wadu. Wadu stayed there, and he wanted to talk to the missionary. Wadu was a chief of a tribe that was not, so, not too far from where this tribe was at, and Wadu talked to the missionary. He said, missionary, I understand what you guys have got is real. So what I want you to do is come over and tell my people about it. The missionary told him, he said, Wadu, you don't understand. He said, these people where I'm at, this tribe, these people are just babes in Christ. He said, they've accepted Christ, but I can't just up and leave them here. They'll just die spiritually. He said, I've got to work with these people and, and build a church and get them firm, firmly uh, rooted in the Word of God. He said, well, what I'll do, Wadu, is I'll call back to the United States and I'll see if we can get another missionary to come to your tribe. And uh, he told Wadu, he said, come back in a week and I'll see what, I can, what we can find out. Wadu left, and he went back, and he told his people, and they got excited, and they came back after a week had gone by. When they came back to the missionary's house, they met there in his living room, and the missionary had to tell him with tears in his eyes, Wadu, I'm sorry, there's nobody at home. Wadu was obviously devastated. They'd gotten all dressed up. They were excited. What I mean by all dressed up is they had their regular loincloth, a couple extra feathers hanging off. And Wadu had something that the other guys didn't have in his tribe. He had a pouch on his side. Wadu reached down, and he grabbed his pouch, and he'd just been told that there's nobody to come. He took the top off his pouch and he reached in. And he pulled out a little stick and he threw it down on the ground and he said a little something. Pulled out another stick and he threw it on the ground. He said a little something again. He did that for almost 200 sticks. Each time pulling one out and saying something and throwing it on the ground. The missionary asked him, Why do you, what are you doing? Why do you told him, he said, Missionary, I'm the only one that has this pouch said, in my pouch are little sticks, and each stick represents somebody in my tribe. Somebody dies, I take the stick out, and I get rid of it. Somebody's born, I get a new stick, I put a new name with it, I put it in my pouch. He said, unless somebody comes and tells us about the Word of God, unless somebody comes and tells us about Jesus, each stick is going to die and go to hell. That story, obviously the missionary was devastated. That story was originally, happened, was originally told in 1985. And that missionary came back to the United States and began to tell people as much as he could. And that story was told all over the United States. A missionary finally made it to Wadu's tribe in 1998. In the year 2000, Wadu's people got the gospel and a lot of people in Wadu's tribe finally got saved. Praise the Lord that Wadu's tribe got the word of God. But the sad thing is that it took 13 years. And in those 13 years, Wadu died. And as far as we can tell, as far as we know, Wadu died and went to a Christless eternity. For 13 years, Wadu asked, he begged, please, somebody send us a missionary. Please, somebody send us a missionary. Now for three years, there's five tribes up in the mountains in the Gulf province that have been asking, please, somebody send us a missionary. Please, somebody send us a missionary. Those five villages by name are Kamina, Kaintiba, Kanabea, Kanantaga, and Kamu. I would never ask you to remember all five by name. One thing is unique about all five villages, they start with a K. Kamina, Kaintiba, Kanabea, Kanantaga, and Kamu. All five start with a K. I want, you, I want to ask that you guys pray for the Allen family in the country of Papua New Guinea, but specifically for those five K villages. For three years now, they've been asking, somebody please send us a missionary. Please send us a missionary. I ask that you would please pray they'll get a missionary. This time, we'll go ahead and show the slides, and uh, we're going to try to have Ariel sing with us. We'll see if it happens. I can still see you for the most part. Who all, every, how many people know where Papua New Guinea is at? Hey, Amen. We got a couple educated people. Uh, all right, I'll show you. We've been on deputation for almost a year. And we realized somebody came up to me after the service and said, where's Papua New Guinea at? I found out the majority of people haven't got a clue. Uh, it's just north of Australia. Australia, I'm going to kind of draw it here on the map. Uh, I, just, I always think of Australia as a dog's head, and this is where the ear is on Australia. And so Australia is just to the south. It's about an hour flight south of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is on the eastern half of the second largest island. This is the second largest island in the world. On the eastern half is Papua New Guinea. On the western half is a country called Irian, or 
as a part of a country called Irian Jaya. Irian Jaya is part of Indonesia and goes off this way. And then up to the north is Vietnam and uh, the Philippines, Southeast Asia. And uh, Papua New Guinea has uh, had several different names given to it. It's been called the land of the unexpected. It's been called an island paradise. Uh, different people have different perspectives. And uh, it's home to some of the most exotic plant and animal life in the world. There's animals and plants there that are not found anywhere else in the world. But not only that, it's home to some of the most friendly people in the world until you run over one of their pigs. One of the obstacles that faces a missionary in the country is their terrain. And uh, they gained their independence in 1975 from Australia. And uh, since then, no major road construction has been done in the country. And uh, we don't see in the future any, any road construction being done. And as you can tell here, uh, road construction is pretty much impossible. Uh, so that leaves transportation either being on foot or by airplane. And uh, it's been estimated what it takes two to three days on the ground is equal to about 10 minutes in the air. And uh, the Lord's enabled me to have several different uh, opportunities. Got my private instrument, commercial pilot's licenses, as well as my airframe and power plant mechanics license. And uh, we've got everything that we need to work in the country with an airplane except for the airplane. And so if uh, anybody happens to have one under their pew or in the back seat of their car, uh, we'll take care of it after the service if you'd like to see me about that. Um, right here in the middle of the picture is uh, an airstrip. Those little airstrips dot the country all over the place. And uh, they just, I, they have literally opened up the country. Anybody, any tribe that understands anything about the outside world knows one thing. If they need, if they need to get out in a hurry, they're, they're going to have to have a radio and an airplane. Here is a tribe called Boo, and uh, these tribes are literally hundreds of years behind in technology. Uh, this helicopter on the side there is 1966 model he uh, helicopter. These people probably never seen anything like it in their life. Hundreds of years behind in technology, and some of them have got no idea of life beyond their own island. This tribe here, we've been flying for about an hour and a half over mountains over over, or over jungles. All of a sudden, find this village out in the middle of nowhere. No roads in, no roads out. These people got no idea of life beyond their own island. Different people in the country are defined by a characteristic of those people. What I mean by that, there's the tree people. They live up in the trees. They're short. They're nomadic people. And they actually live up in the trees. They build tree houses and whatnot. I told you about the Basodio people all speak in one language. There's the canoe people. They live along lowland rivers, and they travel in canoes. Then there's also the grass skirt people. That's called us to the grass skirt people. And uh, they're the ones that live in those 5K villages. And uh, here get to see why they, where they get their name from is the grass skirt. The ones that have been totally untouched with outside influence, uh, that's exactly what they wear. It's a grass skirt and that's it. And so obviously, as you can tell, we kind of got to be careful about what pictures we put on our slides. Our plan is to enter the area and to establish a positive relationship with those people. We want to show them that we care about them, that we don't, we're not out to eat them or anything. Um, then after that, we want to uh, win souls and plant churches. Our goal for each place that we go is to leave behind a national, self-supporting, self-propagating church with a national pastor. That will leave us to uh, free us up to go on to other areas and do the exact same thing. The goal of a missionary is to work himself out of a job. Our plan, uh, I would ask that you pray for the Allen family, for the country of Papua New Guinea. I told you specifically pray for the 5K villages as we seek to do God's will. All that he wants, us, all that he wants from us is a crucified heart. In my own strength, I am so weak, nothing I do will last. But with power from you, Lord, everything that I do will be here when time has passed. Lord, give me a crucified heart, broken in two, remade exactly like you. Lord, may I be willing.
Bible says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you, preacher.